So I finally played Prey, and it took me back to my experience with The Witcher 3 and Metro Last Light. Not because those games are remotely similar, but because they were also gateways. A chance for me to finally get behind a studio I've been wanting to love for years. Arcane Studios are one of the few developers in the gaming industry attempting to continue what Looking Glass and Ion Storm left behind, with System Shock, Thief, and Deus Ex. My issue with titles like the original Dishonored were never their aspirations, but their execution. I spent six hours with that game trying to engage, instead of being engaged. Thankfully, that game's success has allowed Arcane to refine and hone their craft, rather than being relegated to a support studio, as they were after the release of Dark Messiah. Similar to 4A Games and Project Red, I felt guilty in the early hours of Prey, out of line for doubting Arcane's skill that worked tirelessly to make this game one of the most liberating and creative-driven experiences I've had in years. The biggest thing to spoil for viewers isn't a plot, but gameplay, as the amount of ways to traverse, explore, and fight is so vast that experiencing them in the moment is something to preserve. But for those who want to hear more, let's continue. In video games, there's always been a progression towards making the player's inputs replicate their character's actions. The timing of animation, sound effects, and visuals all work together to make reloading a weapon, sprinting, or turning a wheel just right. What's received less attention are the worlds we inhabit, specifically in how they react to your actions, and that's mostly due to priorities. Shooters have been a large chunk of the market since the late 90s, and in a shooter, first or third person, making the gunplay engaging comes first. And this is why I don't believe it's accurate to call games like System Shock or Deus Ex FPSs. They're first person and they have guns, but there's a clear distinction between Doom and Prey. Like its precursors, Prey doesn't care about your screen centering skills. Hitboxes are large, and weapons have forgiving accuracy and range. Rather, it cares about your attention to Talos 1, the space station your protagonist is trapped on. In the beginning, it's just about placing explosives or finding a hidden hatch, but it steadily builds towards having the entire station mapped out in your head with a multitude of shortcuts, pathways, elevators, exploits, and exits. There's nothing inherently wrong with linear titles. One of them was a personal favorite last year, but Prey has you constantly discovering more about the world in both gameplay and story. Side quests, audio logs, and environments don't feel separated from the main narrative, but a part of the bigger story that goes beyond your character's involvement. Crew members don't feel like disposable clones, but real people with their own traits and fears. You're effortlessly immersed in this place of gorgeous architecture and horrifying creatures, and without kill barriers, canned animations, or arbitrary upgrade restrictions. Arcane was actively aware of these decisions, creating weapons, tools, and abilities that encourage you to utilize this freedom. The glue gun can build entire pathways for you to traverse. Grenades can reduce objects blocking your path and enemies threatening you to bits of material that then assist you in crafting anything from health kits to sentry turrets. Nothing is abstract or arbitrary. Everything in Prey, from the weapons to abilities to the crafting and level design, all work together to make for a cohesive and compelling whole. The unity of Prey's design is its strongest aspect. It was when I discovered you could activate switches with the toy gun that I fell in love and that I received said toy by stumbling upon an area that crew members used to play in while off the job. It's storytelling that's only possible in gaming, and to see it with the fidelity of CryEngine is a real treat, combined with the sound design that is some of the best I've heard. Debris will collide into the station, making for an ear-piercing scare every few minutes. The soundtrack immerses and alerts you, and the sounds themselves, such as the nightmare, are unnerving to the core. Attention to detail is superb with notes or child's drawings left by crew members, becoming objects in the environment, alcohol filters that aren't absurd, triggers based on your powers, and more. However, it's this detail that does call a few things into question, specifically the segregation of certain menus, hacking, and where the game chooses to ease things up. As many have probably heard, one of the best parts of this game are the mimics. They're a unique enemy that evolves something we've fought for years and make it feel fresh again. While they naturally become less of a threat compared to your first encounter, there's something to always keep in mind. You can be in a room reading emails on a computer for minutes, only to take a few steps and have one leap at you from the trash. I normally detest jump scares, but in Prey, the horror is truly dynamic. There's no scripted sequence where you're forced into an intentionally dark and silent room until a thing goes a boogie woogie woo. It's all generated within the game's systems, but a large part of what makes them a threat is that context. 
of viewing a screen in the environment in real time. Meanwhile, hacking, upgrading, and viewing your map takes place in an alternate dimension where time and space patiently wait for you to hack a drone that'd otherwise fry your face. I'm not trying to be harsh on Arcane, as I understand they're very careful as to not overwhelm gamers unfamiliar with this style, and that less linear experiences like Far Cry 2, Stalker, or Elite Dangerous can lead to some players feeling lost and lose interest. But when Prey does such a phenomenal job of making a fictional space station feel relatable and tangible in a way that so few games achieve, it makes the more traditional elements stand out. Hacking, inventory management, or unlocking abilities don't have the logical systems that computer logs, objects, or physical effects do. Doors can be opened from a distance because you have a device with enough physical force to press that button from the other side. Meanwhile, hacking freezes everything around you because… it's a video game. And speaking of hacking, it's not very good here. Now, hacking is something that's rarely, if ever, been done in a satisfying manner, and it is just a minigame not detrimental to the rest of Prey. But while the recent Deus Ex's hacking can be argued to hurt pacing somewhat, it is a minigame that at the higher levels requires planning, strategy, and timing with limited utilities. There's choices to be made and stakes. Prey doesn't have any of this, instead making you move a dot to a specific location through a forgiving pathway. And your only punishment for failing on the handful of occasions that happens is to take minor damage. Not to worry, as that's normally fixed with a banana on the other side. Plus, the minigame doesn't evolve. Level 4 hacking is the same as level 1. The only difference is that you have to do the same thing three more times. However, when it comes to criticisms, I omitted something at the start. The game did remind me of The Witcher 3 and Metro Last Light, where I gained a huge respect for a developer virtually overnight. But it also reminded me of Alien Isolation, because just like that game, its brilliance overstays its welcome. And in order for me to explain, it's time to get into spoiler territory. Prey's levels are expertly crafted in almost all areas. The game's consistency in providing multiple options in ways that aren't absurd to the environment is nothing short of impressive. Each level has its own unique layout, hazards, and visuals. When entering for the first time, these levels are intimidating tense, yet begging for exploration. The player is able to indulge in their wonder, and the best part is, this magic resurfaces throughout the game. Just because you're entering an area for the second time, it doesn't mean there's nothing to fear. Enemies can come back to dominate areas you previously wiped clean, and depending on your actions, new types might even be encountered in old places. It makes revisiting levels as unnerving as it is exciting. I just about had a heart attack the first time I stumbled upon a nightmare, and once more after realizing its appearance was tied to what I invested in my character. And the best part, unlike a lesser open world that forces you into the same pathways for transferring between sections repeatedly, Talos 1 is laid out more like an oval. It doesn't begin this way, but in the second and third acts, you'll be able to quickly drift around the station in a loop as you marvel at the scope of what you've memorized. However, instead of using these new environments, encounters, and entrances to build up to a grand finale, the game goes on, and on, and on, and on, and on, and on. and on, and on, and on, and on, and on, until you're met with a horrendously abrupt ending that probably should have happened five hours earlier. Areas that you previously indulged become infuriating to navigate. You'll be flying at the speed of sound to load into a new area only to walk ten steps and encounter yet another loading screen. Also, you can collect the one thing you need and do the same journey in reverse, likely to give it to an NPC, which leads me to another issue with the third act. Mechanically, Prey is mostly superb. The convenience of the operators and ammo count of the glue gun may feel overly casual to veteran players, but the flexibility of the environment, combat, and how everything combines is hard to fault. The space station is vast and threatening while you're alone, piecing together the narrative through audio logs, operators, computers, objects, and the handful of characters that you talk to over comm channels. It was a wonderful moment when you finally see Daniela in the flesh, just from being the first normal person you meet after hours of gameplay. But it's when you encounter the rest of the crew members that you realize why the game truly had so few interactions with NPCs. Even if we're dead, it won't be over. We'll still be at their mercy. Like if only I could have put out the fire. It's contained, but I could have done more. The way they just... If only I had reached the power supply in time. 
What's wrong with you? The third act reveals what's behind the curtain, but not in the way I think the developers intended. Because the game's mechanics and systems aren't quite strong enough to maintain their wonder and excitement for 20 hours. The nightmares lose their terror when you realize they just vanish the moment that timer is drained, or when you've got enough ammo to fight an army of typhons. The amazing sound design is dampened by the bizarre voice recording that makes the actors sound like they were ordered to chew their microphone. The drop in quality and padded gameplay I think is the reason why most comments I've seen about Prey's twist ending don't seem particularly shocked by it. Speaking personally, after skipping combat sequences due to my growing impatience and running back and forth on the station for hours, just to get a WE DID IT screen, I knew there had to be more to it than that. And surprise, there was a post credit sequence. It's a shame because the twist is a rather brilliant incorporation of the simultaneous immersion and disassociation with the protagonist that almost all games have. And unlike Dishonored, morality isn't handled with a hard-laced gameplay system but narrative context that strikes much harder at the emotional core. However, with all that said, this game's weaker third act, just as with Levine's homage, doesn't negate Prey's magic. Talos 1 is one of the best worlds I've experienced in a game, and the improvement that Arcane has shown in just a few years is remarkable. All there's to hope for now is that this Prey will get the sequel it deserves. This game was gifted to me by the Gamertron Show, an excellent YouTuber in his own right, so be sure to give him some love. And thank you, Gamertron, for sending me this awesome game. How do you actually choose which series get featured in years later? Halo was the first franchise I covered because it's the one I've sunk the most time into over the years, followed by Mass Effect. And then games like Spec Ops The Line have greatly influenced me in terms of what I do and what I hope to do in the future. My connection to Years Later, though, has always been a secondary aspect of it. To me, the primary goal with Years Later is to cover the past, present, and future of the games. Do you consider your voice a blessing or a curse? Neither, because then it would have to be remarkable in some way. Is pineapple an acceptable topping on pizza? Yes! Tits or ass? Both! <laughs> Favorite operator in Rainbow Six Siege? Oh, that's a really tough one. Though, funny enough, the characters that I have the highest kill-death ratio with are IQ and Ella, which means that my skill is dependent on how tight the character's pants are. 